Why is it? We always have shit. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we had 60 people at the meetup, the first one in Bedford. 60 people? At the meetup, wow. yeah. BTC Gandalf was there, I think. He was there, yeah. yeah. He came yeah. and he drove down. The, he was like, I'm thinking of coming. I was wow. like, what, from Scotland? He's like, yeah, yeah, I might just drive down. He did. My God. Like this. So we just we signed go. this lad Pause. two minutes into his uh, league debut for us. He's just arrived. Oh, MG. It was a bit jumpy, <laughs> that. Yeah. That's how to, that's how to arrive. We had, uh, we had nearly 300 people there. Like last year, we were getting like 40. And who was the other team you were playing against? Rushton and Higgum. And they... They were like a couple of places below us last season, but okay. we're so much stronger now. I mean, that guy there, Dan Walker, we signed for Bedstown. They won step four last year. So he's a proper good player. Um, I mean, they hit the bar, but I mean, mm. we could. It was comfortable, wasn't it? Yeah, we so, could have six or seven. And what's the plan um, in terms of getting to Premier? I mean, <laughs> I think people took that too uh, serious. Uh, the, no, the plan is to get into the league, football league. Okay. Um, that's the plan. And it's based on two things creating, uh, you've got to get a crowd down. Mm. Um, either my Bitcoin needs to massively increase in value, <laughs> or I need to keep convincing Bitcoin companies to sponsor it. But I think momentum is everything. I yeah. think if we're crushing it, we're top. Of, we should we should win the league with the best team. Um, if we're top of the league by February next year, I can go back to all the sponsors and say we delivered. Okay, but you need sponsorship to go into the league. You I, can't uh, just at the top. You automatically go in. Look, so we're we're a nothing club. Uh, where we had the only people who would come last season would be people who had fam like their family play for the team, mm. and now we're building a community, but. 300 people come into a game will make you maybe 2,000 pounds or two home games a month, 4,000. You say half of that for running the club. That gives you 500 quid a week wages. It's hard to compete on that. We've got the best budget, which is 1,500 pound a week wages. But the only reason we can pay that is I've got good sponsors. Mm. On top of that, we put in a new ir irrigation system, 20 grand. Um, We've taken on a ladies' team. We've bought them all new equipment, mm. merch, everything. Uh, sorry, tracksuits and kit. We've spent 20 grand on that. We've taken on a youth team. We've spent 10 grand on their stuff. So, like, all the money the sponsors have invested is essentially us, like a startup, just out of the gate running, getting, wow. you know, taking on the biggest women's team locally, taking on the youth team, sorting out our ground, sorting out our signage, sorting out our merch, getting our website sorted, having a videographer to do it. We it is basically like setting up a company. Totally. And uh, but the difference with this, it will never scale to the point of uh, exponential growth in terms of revenue. Mm. What it most likely does is get to the point where it's sustainable. So if we can get into the town center and play our games at the rugby club, our crowd will probably go from 300 to maybe eight, 900. And then our, at this level, our income would allow us to have the best budget in the league. Mm. And you've got to keep growing that through the leagues. But I think we'll always need like sponsors or people like Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss who say, give me some money to make us do it. But we do have a Bitcoin meetup which had 60 people come to it. And we're about to teach all the players about Bitcoin. We're going to put QR codes on their social media cards. So if they score a goal, it goes up and they get tips. You know, there's a buzz around this town. And in some ways, this could become like a, an El Zonte kind of thing in that we create this kind of sporting local community that's all around Bitcoin and it just spreads the knowledge. So, but it only works with sponsors. Um, no, we can only launch with sponsors. Give us five years, we might become sustainable because we have a bars and a crowd in the town. And people come for it. Yeah, yeah. but but we've spent, we spent like 200,000 pre-season on getting everything ready. Like our streaming, it costs us 60 grand a year to stream all the games 60 grand yeah because it's about 1500 pound a game because they you have a commentator four cam or three cameras instant replays all that kind of stuff to do it right but because of that we have you know a few hundred tuning into each game which mm. hopefully become a thousand they're also buying merch right but clubs at our level ca cannot do this mm. like we operate honestly i think the standards of what we're trying to do on a lot of the levels are crap premier league good championship in that we do a printed program that's nice. Our website is the bollocks. You know, we, we're trying to do everything top level, but we can only do it because we've got the money. 
Yeah, but I think if you, with everything, if you start with passion, yeah. if you're really passionate about what you do, then you can figure everything else out. Yeah, and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're doing good stuff. I mean, yeah, the other <laughs> um, big local team, they gave up the ladies team. They kind of just didn't look after them. And we're like, well, that's ridiculous. Like, you've got to have ladies football as part of this. So we've taken them on. And the game, what would you say the mix is women to men on Saturday? It was higher than I thought. I reckon it was like, I don't know, 60, 40 men? Yeah. 60, 40, you know, a lot. 60, 40 men. 60 men, 40% women, yeah. And girls. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's and pretty good. But it was like a family event, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. And if you think the girls just won the Euros, you know, it's good timing. So anyway, the plan isn't the Premier League, the plan's Football League, six promotions. Step by step. Step by step. Hopefully in six seasons. Anyway, man, how are you? I'm really good. Um, I'm enjoying walking along the, along the river in, in Bedford. Beautiful it's very relaxing there, right? with the swans and everything. It was nice. Yeah, Bedford's actually. Thank quite... you for the recommendation on where to stay. The embankment. Yeah, it's the, the best pub, best pub in town. Got to get Danny up there at some point. But um, no, it's a really nice part of the town. Mm. Um, I love it. I love my hometown. I could tell you. You're really passionate about it. Bedford Maximus. <laughs> so last time we spoke was a while back. You were at Coin Floor. Yes. Yeah. That feels. It was only. It was less than two years ago, but it feels like. A lifetime ago. Now yeah. you're running the hottest startup in Bitcoin. Everyone's talking about it. Um, it we had an incredible launch, and we're we're really humbled by by the reception. But yeah, it's 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 so amazing. The people I work with just love it every day. How, how did that transition from CoinFloor to this happen? Um, so CoinFloor, the last. The last couple of years, I became aware of the fact that I wanted to do something else. CoinFlow was great. It was a great experience. Um, and we had a number of firsts, but it was very focused on the UK. And right from the beginning, I'd been very interested and passionate about bringing Bitcoin to the world, starting with the global self. And with traditional finance, VCs and investors, it, the idea of your second market being Nigeria or Venezuela was just not going to happen. Also, um, at the same time in 2019, uh, the Financial Action Task Force um, approved um, the travel rule. And from being this one of the first regulated exchanges in Gibraltar and Europe, um, for me, it was very clear that over the following three to six years, we were going to see um, the situation for people being able to take their Bitcoin off exchanges get more and more difficult. So I decided at that point that I wanted to find ways of getting people off exchanges because at that stage, already 90 to 95% of our users would keep their money on exchanges, even though we were trying to get it off, um, almost begging them to take it off. And that situation was getting worse as regulation became worse. And at the same time, I started also looking at ways to find people to purchase um, CoinFloor who had the same philosophical leanings as I did. Um, and that's where it started. I, so over the following year, I went to um, Hackers Congress, um, Paralelo Police in Prague, and I was fortunate enough to meet now um, one of my co-founders, Eric Syrian. Um, and yeah, he was explaining this idea called Federated Chamian Mints. I was explaining some ideas I had about getting people off exchanges. He politely told me that most of my ideas were, were terrible, but in a very polite way. Um, and then he explained this Federated Chamian Mint idea. And from his point of view, it was, a, it was a privacy solution and it was an incredible privacy solution. But from my context, um, in terms of trying to get people off exchanges um, and my context of the global South and, and especially West Africa, um, I realized that this was something much more. It was a, f a new form of community decentralized custody. 
So instead of being your own bank, you could be your own community bank. And it stood some way between the gold standard or the Bitcoin standard of self-custody. And then this situation where we're at now, where most people are holding their money on exchange. And this was a really interesting middle ground. Yeah, it really stood out to me after, um, after I'd been out to El Salvador, because uh, visiting El Zonte a few times, mm. uh, watching people collect their Bitcoin when they had these community events, exactly. and, and then seeing them go back home. Um, and I was starting to think about custody for these people, because uh, I obviously have a multi-sig uh, custody solution, uh, cold storage for myself, which involves distributing keys into mm. multiple locations yep. and yeah, and certain access rights, yeah, yeah. But it's very much a uh, developed Western solution. And I was thinking, well, this person's going back to a place which is essentially uh, like a constructed uh, shack of sorts. Um, and not that I'm being derogatory towards it, it's just the reality of their situation. I was thinking, well, how does this person self custody? They they have a phone. Um, one, can they afford a hardware wallet? If they can, where are they hiding it? Um, if they're going to back up their private key again, where they're hiding it, if they're going to do multi sig, I was just like, this doesn't work. You know, something like Casa as a multi sig solution is great if you're in a developed Western nation and you can afford it. Um, and at the time, I was just, just really struggling. We talked about it on the show, and I hadn't, I didn't know how this was going to be solved. And once I heard about these federated mints, I was like, oh, hold on a second, this is a potential solution for these communities. Yeah, I think it's. Uh... And for some people, it, it could be this process of graduation to self-custody. But I think the thought process was, right now we're at point A, and we want to get to point Z or Z uh, for you, the US audience. Is uh, it, it's Z, yeah. We want to get to Z. And Z is hyper-Bitcoinization globally. Now, um, most of the solutions that I've seen around custody take us from A to B to C. So they're better custody, they improve upon where we are. But what we did is look at, well, what does the world look like when everybody's using Bitcoin, when there are billions of people on using Bitcoin? And when you look at that world, a few things become clear. One, the vast majority of people will be using Lightning as their daily driver. That's that's what they'll be using for transactions and so on, receiving and sending. Um, people are receiving it for salaries. People will be receiving it as a merchant and spending money to buy goods and services as well as holding. And also, just given the limitations of the Bitcoin network at the base layer, the um, majority of people will not be transacting on chain most of the time, if ever. So once you realize that, and you realize that we're going to go from a world where most people right now have multiple UTXOs to their name, if they're holding Bitcoin, to a world where UTXOs will be shared by multiple people, then you need some way of doing that, which isn't holding it on an exchange. Because at the moment, the only choice that you have is to, to have that sort of world is everybody storing it in a centralized manner with effectively a stranger, someone you don't know, whose incentives, as we've seen time and time again, often don't align with your own. Yeah, or they can make mistakes, or people can hack things, and there's just that you know, risk of holding there. That's why we always encourage people to get their coins off the exchange. But it feels like it's more than just that, though. Feels like this is more of a, um, it's a bridge between the fiat world and the Bitcoin world, and that, like you say, you be your own bank, but like this kind of access to a community bank, it feels like it's, it's a little bit more goal driven rather than commercial, commercially driven. I know you've raised funds, but it still feels more like a, you're trying to build what is the end solution for, well, as you said, people yeah. using it, the Z. Yeah, when we started, so when I um, met Eric, um, it was and remains and will always remain in um, Fediment, that is the core protocol. This protocol for what I like to call the the third pillar of the Bitcoin open source ecosystem. Yeah, so, explain the three. 
So the first pillar is, is decentralized censorship resistant money or store of value. That's, that's Bitcoin itself. And it's almost like this foundational layer. Uh, but the next is decentralized censorship resistant payments. And that's the Lightning Network. Um, that gives you a mechanism to scale the store of value to basically, theoretically, an, an unlimited amount of transactions if it's a well-structured um, network. Um, and what was missing is this decentralized, censorship-resistant custody system so that people everywhere can custody Bitcoin without having to rely on a presumably regulated third party. And that was fairly meant. I know we're going to have to get into the details of how it's going to work. Um, but the thing I was starting to think about is that uh, there's obviously issues with uh, buying from exchange. The big one, something that Matt O'Dell will smash me on the head hmm. and talk about over again, is issues with KYC AML. Um, and I know you're solving a custody solution, but uh, will people be able to accumulate Bitcoin within a Chalmian Mint and avoid exchanges totally? So I, I, I think the short answer is yes. Um, what we are trying to do in, to, your, to your previous question is think about this solution holistically. So custody is a key part of it. Payments um, and settlement through Lightning is a key part of it. And obviously the money itself is a key part of it. But we're not just focused on creating a great new form of community custody. We're focused on helping form societies or cities or towns that are hyper-Bitcoinized. Uh, we're defining, just so we have a yardstick, we're defining hyper-Bitcoinizers, more than 50%, so 51% of the community using Bitcoin every day. And that's by using, not including just holding or just investing or, or just speculating, but buying, selling, using as a means to transfer other forms of value like stable coins or whatever it may be every single day. Um, and when you want to get to that target, it focuses the mind. So you have to solve or have to help promote solutions to the to the end to end process. So if that means being able to transact in this in a store in the way that the user is comfortable with and or training them or educating them that's all part of solving it. So we don't just plonk in a, in a, in a technology, but we, we provide training and infrastructure so that they can use it end to end without having to rely on central third parties if they so wished. And you obviously, I don't know, have you done any dev work or are you still scoping the dev work? Oh, we've done a lot of dev work. But, but it's not available yet. You can't create one, right? Um, it will be available very soon. So, um, in we're hoping to have a signet version um, of the Fediment software. The aim is uh, in August. And do you have a test, uh, like test town you're gonna be placed in this? Is there a test scenario you're working on? So we have multiple potential test okay. towns or cities or countries. It's Bedford one. Uh, um, Bedford, <laughs> well, we can talk afterwards. Um, so well, what's an ideal test? So, but we have a series of criteria. Um, but so we're doing a couple of things. One, um, we're going to be rolling out the um, software. There's two different things. So there's this open source project, Fediment, which we're working very hard to maintain um, its open source nature because we want it to be a protocol that everybody uses. We have a number of incredible. Um, donors and sponsors um, um, providing donor uh, and donor and sponsorship for that. And then we have the commercial company, Feddy, which is working on a wallet, which will be likely the first wallet to implement the Feddy Mint protocol. Um, so the timelines for those, um, they're obviously dependent because you can't roll out Feddy before Feddy Mint. So the Feddy Mint timelines we're aiming for um, the end of this before the end of this year ideally within the next couple of months um, to announce a version to be used by hackers enthusiasts and so on so that we can start kicking the tires and anyone can download that what's the relationship between the two are they essentially two separate entities they're, they're two separate things so 
Um, it wasn't until a few months ago um, that we really started looking at FedEye um, or Feddy. Um, you could call it FedEye because it sounds like Jedi. Um, sounds but, like the Fed. Oh, oh, well, some people say that, but that's, but that's just fed. coincidence. Like be, be your own Fed. <laughs> you can be your own Fed, yeah. Um, so Feddy Mint has been worked on as an open source protocol. It is the actual decentralized custody system. You, it's run by members of your community, trusted members of your community. So each person will run a server and they work together to run one to manage a multi-signature wallet for any Bitcoin that's deposited to it. And also to manage this federated Chalmia Mint, which is effectively creates these IOUs for the Bitcoin that can then be held by you on your, on your mobile app or viewed and accessed by, by users. And the, the Chalmia Mint is highly private and privacy preserving. It's a, it's a very mature, old and established mechanism for providing privacy within this sort of walled garden of the, of the Federation. So that protocol is available and has been worked on for a number of years um, prior to- Predates your work. Well, no, my, prior to my, well, for, yes. And the idea of Chalmier Mints predates um, Federated Chalmier Mints. Of course, yeah. Um, prior to my meeting Eric, he'd been working on that for over a year and was being sponsored by Blockstream. Um, the idea originally came about, I'd like to say a bit like Bitcoin, there were a number of different things that preceded it, sometimes by decades, but finally got to a point where all of it was available for the idea to, to appear. And when it did, a few people tried to work on it in parallel. So if you look at the constituent elements, first of all, in early 19, 1983, we had and the ideas behind Chalmian Mints and blinded signatures by David Chaum, who was one of the people referenced in, in Satoshi's white paper. And this was the lead up to the idea of, of Chalmian Mints, but so this was this sort of privacy preserving protocol, but it required money, cash, to be sent to a centralized entity, a bank. He posited it would be a bank. You send them cash, fiat cash, and then they would give you these IAUs for that cash. So a trusted. So it was trusted, well, the money was trusted because it used fiat, because mm. Bitcoin didn't exist. And also the, the actor was trusted as well. One at central actor, the bank. But other, so you trusted one person and you trusted the money. But w w ignoring those two points of trust, you had um, within the walled garden of the, of the Chalmian Mint, you had cryptographically um, and theoretically perfect privacy. Um, 1989, I believe, um, he launched DigiCash, mm -hmm. which was implementing a Chalmian Mint and he worked, partnered with banks to receive money and then they would implement the system. Um, and that um, shut down at the end about 10 years later. Um, fast forward to 2008, 2009, white paper and then the launch of the Bitcoin network. So now for the first time you had a money where it could be owned by multiple people. Because up until that, you cannot, we cannot all take um, or manage access to a, a dollar note. You, you, we're all holding it in our hand and paying it. Maybe we could, but it's not very practical. Um, but you can do that with, with Bitcoin because you have the concept of multi-signature uh, wallets addresses. So multiple people can, can take ownership. So that was again, a big milestone. And it's also a mutable privacy preserving meritocratic money. So, you now have the potential of the money being replaced by cash, by, mm. uh, by fiat. And then um, fast forward 2016, 17, the Blockstream's liquid network was launched. Mm -hmm. And that gave us the ability to effectively have multiple people working together to perform uh, some sort of programming task. Um, effectively, it's similar conceptually to multi-party computation, but it's actually different. But the idea you can work together to coordinate to perform a task so once that came out, you had all the constituent elements. Um, and within months of that, um, Eric and a number of other, um, no, two other, I believe, um, 
um, cypherpunks, um, um, hackers, really accomplished programmers um, who would often meet in places like Paralleling Police, Hackers Congress, and so on, thought, how could we combine these elements of charm? Maybe let's combine Charmy and Mint, but instead of swap out the fiat with Bitcoin and the ability for multiple people to take access to Bitcoin, and then swap out one bank with a federation, because Liquid came up with the idea of federations, but a federation of people working together, the same people who are holding the keys, also to run the Charmy and Mint. So we can effectively federate this form of um, privacy, which is uh, an incredibly strong price, incredibly strong privacy guarantees. Okay, so can you talk or well, walk me through how it physically works, like the process? So if I say in here, I'll try my best. Try your best. Um, say here in Bedford, I'm like, you know what? We need a community federated mint. Uh, I want to create one. What is what is it I actually do? Like in terms of the community I have to build to manage it and then technically to deliver it. Yeah. So um so yeah, let's say you're in Bedford and you've got Danny, Danny yourself, and well, you first of all, the first thing you you as a community would do is decide who within your community I uh, have you know a track record of being trustworthy. Um people who maybe <laughs> So you may not include yourself <laughs> in that list, um, but people I like to think who um, prioritized social capital at least as much as they prioritized financial capital. Mm. Because of, if you think about the incentives, you're asking these people to look after capital, so financial capital. So if they prioritized um, social capital very highly, I honor uh, standing in the community and so on, that will probably be a good, good starting point. Um, and over your lifetime of being in the community and so on, you're going to have an idea of people who have just, you know, have a track record of just being, you know, knights, almost like honorable, you know, trustworthy, reliable, et cetera, et cetera. So you find a, a, a group of those and, and they agreed to be what we like to call guardians of the Federation. So being a guardian is, um, other than, just having good character and so on doesn't require too much. We're going to try and make it as simple as possible. You're going to need to run a Bitcoin full node mm -hmm. and the Fedimint software, the protocol. So we're going to work with people like Raspberry Blitz, Umbrel, Noddle, et cetera, Start9 to make this sort of really, really easy. You basically um, download the software or you buy one of these devices and it will be an, an option there to install Fedimint. Then you're gonna need to, as part of the setup process, and again, you, you run, you, the longest part is like syncing the, the Bitcoin full node. Fedimint's part is only a few moments more. And as part of the setup, you're gonna basically provide what are the IP addresses of the other Federation members. Let's say you found five in, in a, a village of 500. So you, you put the IP addresses of the of other people and the system will self-organize, connect and set up a federation. And what is actually created when a federation is created? So there are two parts. One, um, you will personally set up a, um, a, a public private key for one guardian, if you were one, one of the guardians, a public private key for... Um, yourself and your own um your own part of the multi-sig and once that's done you'll do two things you will you will form a multi-signature wallet by coordinating with the other guardians and you'll also form this sort of almost like a decentralized service which is the the charmy mint service which is able to issue create new ious and is also able to destroy those ious and is also able to convert. Think of it like a software equivalent of a kiosk teller machine. So um, think about the example of you're going to a fairground mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a kiosk there at the entrance. And when you go into the fairground, there's lots of rides and so on. Um, you can give them your, um, you can give them your cash and they take your cash and then they, they 
in this example, they take a piece of paper and they just write a number of notes, different tokens that represent different amounts of money, representing up to the equivalent amount of cash you're given them, and they give them to you. Um, you can now go around onto rides and you can use them. If you don't have enough right the right change, you can come back to the kiosk and say, can you give me a change for this 10 um, pound um, note that they gave you? And they can replace it with um, 10 one pound notes and then it can give you change as well. And if they ever receive a token from you, they destroy that and then they create new ones. And if you are leaving the fairground, you can go back with whatever notes you have and you can give them, you can choose to give some or all of them to the, to the kiosk and they will look at the total value, destroy them, and then takes, go back to their safe and take some of, the, um, some of the cash they have to the equivalent amount and give that to you. So those are the things that they can do. And the elements in terms of the system is the, is the safe to store the, to store the um, cash. And then the ability to, and then the, the piece of paper and pen, which gives them, the, and the bin, effectively the ability to create um, IOUs and destroy IOUs. And so those are the two bits that each um, guardian is managing the, the system to create and destroy the IOUs. Mm -hmm. That's the Chami Mint. And the ability to um, be part of the um, multi-sig that's holding the Bitcoin. So say, say we found five people, we create the, the multi-sig. Do we have a choice whether it's a three or five or a four or five and all those yeah. kind of things? And yeah. there's, I guess there's no limitations. You could have 20 people or 10 of 20 or... So um, these are implementation things that yeah. we're dealing because we want to balance functionality with performance, with simplicity as well. But fundamentally, there's no reason why there's a limitation. There is... Logically, you don't want less than uh, four, maybe three, because you want to have a situation where no one party has the ability to block a transaction. So uh, the, the logical minimum of that will be three, so that two people can always, can always um, make sure a transaction happens. Um, and there's also limitations on the largest number, just from a performance point of view, because more yeah. people, the more coordination needs to happen um, to, to sign transactions or perform any action on the system. So although there's no hard and fast limit, it's likely that most will be between three, four, five on the low end and sort of 15, 16 to 20 on the high end. So say here in Bedford, I, I find 10 members of the community that I think they're upstanding members that we trust, want to do this with. And they say, a, I don't know, let's call it a five of 10 for the sake of this. What you'd, is wanna, it? you'd probably want to make it show that there's a majority need to sign. So majority. six of 10. Six of 10. Yeah. So say we have the six of 10. What are the things they're having to sign? And is it a manual process each time? So they're, so they, they need to download um, the, the Fediment software. Uh -huh. And it, again, it will normally be automatic as part of something like uh, a an umbrella, Raspberry Blitz, mm. Star9, not all that sort of um, system. And just like the Bitcoin node, this is going to be a unattended operation okay. system. So once you've downloaded it and you've put the IP addresses of everybody else and you know kept your own, um, the backup of your own private keys, other than running out of hard drive space in three, four years time or something like that, um, general maintenance or, or restarting a machine if it fails and you know which hopefully it won't do very mm. often just like a bitcoin node just be will just sit there and run you just have to keep it fed and watered with with electricity and internet and say we create this uh e-cash for bedford because it's essentially an e-cash token that's created based on the bitcoin is that that's what the term i've heard um i think for it is it's it's, it's um, eCash is the protocol, um, oh, okay. Charming eCash, yes. And it is a form of IOUs, but just for, um, to avoid confusion, it's, it's still effectively Bitcoin but, because you can spend it, the user experience will be like Bitcoin. It's just, but, but yes, within the federation, it's, it's these IOUs giving access to a pot of Bitcoin that's being held yeah, by I'm the I'm, people. I'm thinking in like UX, I'm going back to my UX days, thinking in UX, like I've, I've uh, yep. say Danny's created, and I want want to get some of this um, 
this Bitcoin within this uh, Xiaomi Mint. Do I say, do I speak to Danny or is there just a public address I go to and I send the, the, the Bitcoin to it and I get this other token representation back? So, um, so you want to receive some? In the example, you want to receive some Bitcoin, or no? I want, I want to, um, I want to use this uh, federated mint. I want, okay. So in the community, I, I yeah. want some of this, this bit, this version of Bitcoin. Yeah. Do I? Is there a, just like a public address? I just send it to and immediately send something. But how do I actually exchange? Yeah. What's so, the exchange process? So what you want to do is join, join the federation. Okay. So, so let's take it back. Take it step by step. So one thing I didn't go into because I um, is the privacy properties of the Xiaomi Mint in that example of the kiosk. Okay. But that's that's a separate issue. Yeah, we I've can got come a whole privacy with, thing here. So yeah. we can come back to that. But um, so what you would do is, first of all, a federation setup. So it requires, let's say, five or 10 people um, that you trust within this community. They all download this piece of software and effectively click run and put everybody's IP addresses um, and those IP addresses could be in the form of a QR code and they can scan each other's QR codes and they're set up and run. And once it's all configured and running, it's, it just operates. As, as um, guardians, as long as they just keep the machines um, having electricity and internet going to them, that's for the day to day, all they need to do. All signing, all transactions happen in, a, in an unattended way. Okay, so when they, when they have set this up, all of them will from the, the interface of the node will be given uh, the address, the location of the um, federation that this, that's now being created. And it will probably also show it in a form of a QR code as well. So they then download a Feddy Mint aware wallet. Feddy will, will be the first, but we're hoping there'll be others and we're expecting that others will come just like there are multiple lightning wallets and so on, or existing wallets can in, integrate the functionality as well. So they download, let's say, Feddy, um, and the the guardians themselves, and will scan the QR code that was displayed on their, their device, which is the, the location of the federation, and that's it. They're they're signed up. They're done. They've 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 become a member of their own federation. And can anyone join any federation? Anyone can join any federation. Yes, because um, it's cryptographically near perfect privacy, so there's no way to know who can join. However. Um, if you wanted the, the people who are to help with the recovery of your keys in the event of you losing your phone or and not keeping all your backups and so on, which is one of the things that frightens many people from self-custody, you would need to be able to show that there's some, they would need to know who you are to be able to um, help you recover. And so that leads to a social limitation, even though there's no technical limitation, you'd, you'd, you'd have to just be accept the chance that it'll be very hard for, for them to say, okay, a random stranger's come up and ask for something back. And so that, that leads to this, this, this um, limitation, but it's not, not a technical one. Okay, so, so come, but yeah, so I, I so, but the, so another user comes along and wants to join the Federation, uh, let's say Danny, and will come up to you and say, I'm interested in joining the Federation. You'll take your mobile app, You'll click the name of a federation, it'll show you the QR code of the federation, and they will scan it with their version of the app, and they will join. They'll join. And they could potentially, depending on how we want to design the, the, define the UX, we could allow it only guardians to allow people to join, or anyone who's a member can allow anyone to join. That's a UX decision that we're, we're deciding, but let's say anyone can allow anyone to join, then Danny can go up to someone else and um, that person says, you know what, I'm, I'm, you, you, you're always going on about this Bitcoin thing. Um, okay, I finally get it. How do I get this thing? And instead of saying, join, a, join an exchange, they, he can instead say, here, just download this app um, and scan this QR code. Done. And can you imagine people joining multiple federations? Yes. Yeah. So in that scenario, does, does it require the, the token within that federation to have its own name? No, it will always, it will always appear as Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Within, within the federation. But you should think about, um, think about um, if there's an app like Slack, where you have multiple different Slacks you yeah. can join or Discord, multiple different Discords. And within each Discord, you have different conversations. They're not the same conversation, but they're all conversations. 
Um, and so, um, but there's no way of directly transferring a conversation from one Slack to another. Yeah. But this is where the power of either on-chain or on-network, you don't need to have that ability because you can instantly or near instantly use the Lightning Network or relatively quickly use on-chain transactions, although we expect multiple people to use Lightning Network to transfer between federations or between federations and, and other Lightning wallets because the, the Lightning Network is uh, a standard that allows for the interchange between any anything that's lightning aware. But is it is it like liquid? Once I, yeah, you know, once I put my Bitcoin in there and I get liquid Bitcoin, it's it's a different thing. Um, because the Bitcoin's held in a multi sig. It's it's it conceptually it's similar, but instead of one liquid network used by everybody, there was hundreds of thousands potentially of of. Um, Fediments used okay. by different communities, and to send between them, um, you're you're not penalized by that because to send between them, you use the Lightning Network, and so it still just takes a second to send between them or to send out to something that's not in within the federation. So you could, if Danny's in one federation, I'm in another. I can still send in my Bitcoin from my federation to his. Yeah, and it'll take a second, or or however long the Lightning transaction takes to operate, or if Danny has a, um, a wallet Satoshi or a strike wallet or a moon wallet or, or a um, coin corner wallet or any number of the other lightning aware wallets, they could send to you. You could just show him within your, your interface from your point of view, it would look like a, a lightning wallet and you would, you would say create invoice and it will show the QR code. He's, he's in Australia looking through a, a Zoom conversation or a, a Keat conversation nowadays, Keat, yeah. soon. Um, and and he can uh, scan it and the payment will be sent over the Lightning Network. So you're not penalized by being within that federation, which is why it works so well with the Lightning Network. It becomes much more practical because to uh, otherwise to transfer in and out securely will be like, like liquid. You'd have to wait a number of block transactions and so on, and block confirmation, sorry. One, so what I'm trying to understand is the federation's created. Yep. And uh, to join the federation, I, I click the QR code. I've been accepted. I'm now in the federation. Yep. And then I send Bitcoin to a an address, and that gives me this Bitcoin. How do I get this Bitcoin? How do you receive from yeah. that point? Well, so, so let's so let's let's say how do let's, I convert let's... my Bitcoin into this Bitcoin? You would you would have an app. You would have the, let's say the Feddy app, yep. you've just joined, you scan the QR code, you've joined. And then you'll say, create, um, Bedford. Uh, you, for example, you could say, um, create invoice. Mm -hmm. And it, just like with a Lightning, any other Lightning wallet, um, although we're aiming our user interface to be really, really, really simple, but it's ex the same as any other Lightning wallet conceptually. You'd create invoice, you say the amount you want to receive, like, a thousand Satoshi's sets, and then it'll show a lightning invoice. And then you would have a, another wallet, say, that's a lightning wallet, for example, and you would, that's, uh, that's connected to the, to the lightning network with your own um, Bitcoin in it, or you've got an exchange account that supports the lightning network. It, it can also do on-chain, by the way, but I'm just giving yeah. the lightning network example to begin with. And you would paste in the um, the Lightning Network, the, the Lightning invoice, or if it supports scanning, you would you would just scan the QR code, and then a Lightning transaction would would occur, sending the money to this address. If you don't have a wallet that supports the Lightning Network and it's a normal wallet, then you would say invoice as a, a Bitcoin transaction, um, and it will show you the address to send Bitcoin to. And you would then, um, within your Bitcoin wallet, send an amount to that Bitcoin address. And after a number of confirmations, it will appear in your wallet as, as capable of being spent by you. And so that Bitcoin I've sent, I've paid that invoice. Does that go into like a, that like a gets, pool, like into a vault? That goes and, into a multi-signature wallet yeah. managed by the 10 guardians. Yeah, and I get an IOU. And, and then once it's had enough confirmations, 
um, to avoid things like rollbacks on the on the main chain and so on, similar to how Liquid works. Um, this is if you do it on chain. On chain, uh, on yeah. chain. Um, That's not required for Lightning. Um, then um, the uh, Federation um, Guardians machines will know that a number. Just they'll be following the software. Uh, the software says a number of confirmations has gone by. Okay, we can create an equivalent number of of um, eCash tokens mm. for it to be used, um, IOUs effectively, to be used within the system and make them available to be picked up by by the user. Okay, so yeah. it, it, it almost puts those into a vault and gives me a representation. Yeah, so it's a two machines. Yeah. So like that's like the kiosk example. The the multi-sig wallet is the example of, of, a, of a vault, uh, of a, a safety box behind them. And then the piece of paper and the pen and the bin is the creation and destruction of the IOs that relate to it. So you receive some cash, you put it in the vault, that's the multi-sig. And at the same time, you then create, you know, $1, $1, $1, $5, mm. and uh, 2 50 cents. And, and then you create those and you give them to the person in replacement. They can use them within, within, the, uh, within the fairground as much as they want. They can pass them around to other people. Within the fairground, it's a bearer asset, um, but it acts like cash mm. in that system. If they say, well, you know, I, I want to buy this ride for $2 and I've only got $5, a $5 note left, you go back to the kiosk and say, can you give me five $1 um, tokens instead? And they take the $5 token, destroy it, give five $1 tokens back. Oh, so I have to cash. have exact denominations. It's like cash. It's it, literally, it, 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 it like, literally cash. like a bearer cash. It, it operates the way you people think Bitcoin Bitcoin operates when they first hear about it. So it can't it can't do change. Well, you you just the way you'll do change with normal cash. You'd go to the kiosk and ask for change. You go to the bank and get change. Just so it's 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 the way we've been learned to deal with fear, with physical cash. Okay. And that says, and also you can send it directly between people because each note has its own um, is is its own thing, or each token or each coin. So, but, but all of these things are happening, by the way, to you automatically by the software. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, this, yeah. so when it's the change is not right, it will just send a message, and I've got ninety five percent of what I need. The bits that's missing, you send it. It sends a message off to the to the to the mint, and that will destroy that and give you back a set of change in a fraction of a second as you pay. If it's all automatic, that's what I want to know. Yeah, I it's actually, all, it's I actually all don't care about the stuff because I, I'm, I'm trying to think in terms of the user. Yeah, from the user's the point of view, it looks exactly like what they expect. They don't from, literally go to the machine and say, "I need three ones." No, no it's all <laughs> happening automatically, but but it's also just what's happening at a technical level and what's happening at a experiential level. Experientially, it will look like a lightning wallet to a normal user. A lightning wallet which is really simple to use, um, but sign up involves scanning a QR code. And, so, and that's it. And so say me and Dan are in, in the same federation, I send half a Bitcoin to it and I get uh, this half a Bitcoin worth of eCash. Yeah, back. but from your point of view, you've, you've given a lightning invoice and you received half a Bitcoin. Well, so you said it could be base chain or lightning. Yes. Yeah. So are we saying that, um, like, is it like Moon Wallet where mine won't know the difference? Or will I actually have like a base chain and a lightning wallet within the Feddy wallet? So the final UX. Um, to be decided. Is, but but for the purpose, so there's three different, because um, you, you asked an interesting um, question there um, in terms of the nuance, but there's three different types of transactions effectively that occur. One is intra-federation between one federation member and another federation member. And that's eCash mm -hmm. directly, and it doesn't. That's actually at a third layer. If you say base layer is Bitcoin, layer two is Lightning. This is happening in multiple sharded layer threes. We have hundreds of thousands of sharded layer threes, effectively, yeah. each one being its own um, scaling layer. So any transaction happening within that federation, within that village, within that town, doesn't even touch. Not, not only does it not touch the base layer, but it doesn't touch the the network either, the Lightning network. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, and then you have any transaction between um, a someone within a federation and someone outside of a federation, but over the Lightning Network. So that could be someone who's got their own Lightning node or someone is using a centralized Lightning service um, or someone who's using um, one of these sort of semi-centralized, decentralized services or another federation, someone who's in another federation somewhere else. All of those will go over the Lightning Network. And then finally, there'll be transactions 
to the base, to sending money out the system to um, the base chain or receiving money from the base chain. Now, the first two, the way we're currently designing the system, they're gonna be the most frequent ones and they will visually look the same. So they will both look like lightning transactions, even if you're sending it to someone else within the, the Federation. So the ones that most people do somewhere between 99 to 100% of the time, they will look the same. But because the format of, of a Bitcoin transaction versus a lightning invoice and the way it works is a lightning, lightning invoice, the normal modus operandi is invoice and, and pay invoice versus um, address and send money to an address. It might be that the UX for that is slightly different um, than the UX for sending to a, 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 a lightning address, which is what you see on, on um, lightning wallets today. You yeah. have a separation between on-chain and lightning, but there won't be a third separation between lightning and federation to federation. But say, say Danny's not in the federation, and I am, and he sends me a lightning invoice, I can pay that with my from my federated wallet. Yeah, wallet. yeah, exactly, and, and vice versa. And so, what happens is it when I pay that? Does it burn? Say it's a thousand. Does it burn my thousand sats of like the federated e cash, and then send him from like the the centralized? Okay, so here's um, a no. It doesn't do that, um, and this is really interesting. So, um, what happens? And this is actually another really exciting bit about it. Um, so. As I mentioned in the structure, there's no yet there's no lightning node or in the in the, the way it's currently architected for um, running being a guardian. At some point in the future, we might consider adding that, but right now there isn't. So a guardian has got a Bitcoin node and it's got the Fediment software, uh, effectively, which makes the the Bitcoin node is able to coordinate with others to make a, a multi sig, um, and it's also um, able to create this charming mint. But there is no lightning node. So how is it able to interact with the lightning network? It's a question. Yeah. And um, the question is that it doesn't do it directly. It creates this incentive structure to incentivize um, lightning service providers. So people who are running lightning nodes, but with the view to try and make profit from it, to connect up with the, and, and connect up with the um, Federation. And the way they do that is this, they, um, they will also join, say you're running a, an, a, a, you've got a, you're a lightning service provider, you're running a lightning node, so you're part of the lightning network, you're relaying um, um, lightning transactions and earning a fee whenever you do. Um, you will then um, say, you see there's this federation, which is you know, a, a town or a village of five, 600 people all wanting to make and receive lightning transactions. So it's a very lucrative source of revenue for you. You can join that federation and then um, you can make yourself available as a lightning, what we call a lightning gateway between the federation and the lightning network. Right, I see. And so what happens is instead of, um, you normally form channels, payment channels on the lightning network, you form for one of a better phrase, ghost channels, which yeah act and operate like a lightning channel, but it's actually not a lightning, lightning channel. They're um, taking the, federate, the federated. So what will happen is catch. when this person makes the transaction um, to pay, when a person, when, when you look to pay the invoice to, to Danny, who's using uh, a lightning wallet that's connected to the lightning network directly or in another federation, what actually happens is, and it's all transparent to you, it's just you're paying the invoice, but your e-cash is sent from your you to the Lightning Gateway, which is the LSP who's connected up to connected up to the um, um, to your federation, and so so it's not destroyed; it's just sent to their balance, so mm -hmm. their balance of of um, of of eCash tokens increases, and then they on the Lightning Network pay um, out. Pay out. Yeah. But, okay. But because this sort of is replicating the hash time lock contract payment channel logic of the Lightning Network, this ghost channel, it's still transactional. If it fails, then no one ends up um, requiring trust. The LSP does require trust in the Federation though, because they're holding tokens for the period of time they're holding tokens, yeah. but they don't know it require trust with you. It's like a Lightning Channel. But what's in 
incredible about that is this ghost channel could be, it doesn't cost uh, necessarily to open and close this or manage these. So effectively you can open up channels with all of the members of the village without, but use yeah. the same capital across all of them. So mm -hmm. that gives you a number of capital efficiency um, benefits. Imagine you had 500 separate people you had to open up a channel with and you had to lock up 0.1 Bitcoin with them. Mm. Instead, you have 500 people and you could maybe only lock up, that in total would be five Bitcoin you have to lock up. Now you could maybe only hold up, lock up half a Bitcoin and still service 500 people, meaning that you can service more people um, and it becomes more profitable. If it's more profitable, more people set up lightning nodes and, li and more people become lightning service providers, making the network more reliable. And, and say it's a base chain transaction. So I'm, I've got my federated eCash and I, I want to send Danny some <laughs> base chain. Um, does it then burn it? Danny's very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Danny's had a lot of Bitcoin of me. He's got a lot. He's got a lot more than me now. So, but say I've, um, so I want to send the transaction to him. He's given me his address. Mm. What actually happens there? Do I, can I do that? Can I just send to his like Betch32 address? From yes. my yeah, you can. But your what would the wallet do? Send it back to the in that burn? case. That in that case, when you want to send on chain, yeah, you would it would effectively burn it. send it back to the the mint. Yeah, and then they will take those 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 um, IOUs, shred them and put them in the bin, and at the same time go to the to the safe at the back and take out the equivalent amount of cash and send it to the address that you use takes to send so what does it do in terms of fees then because um yeah if i want to send danny 50 cents on the base chain it's like pointless because the fees could at some point be higher mm. do the fees match so the fees that will be charged get passed on to the person okay. so it would come out yeah huh do you think that there will come a time where people won't know whether they're sending to a, a mint or not is there a distinguishing feature of the addresses um they are multi-sig, so you know you're sending to a multi-sig. Yeah. Um, there are potential updates um, to, for example, Taproot or so on, um, and other features that could make it, if we chose to implement it, uh, we will be implementing Taproot, but if we chose to, we can make it so that it's actually not visible to know the difference between a multi-signature transaction and not, and in which case, um, even now, you can know you know it's multi-sig, but that doesn't tell you that it's uh, a a federation. Right. And once you you use a certain address format, you won't even know it's distinguishable from a single sig or a multi-sig. I, th I think I get that. I know. I, know yeah. that. I think I get that. And and the guardians get paid to do their work. Um, so uh, that's a very very interesting question. Um, the Guardians could be paid or they could not be paid. Um, the default and recommended approach is that they, you seek out people who do not wish to be paid. But that is not something that we, that there's nothing in the protocol that ensures that or forces that. That's just based on um, our current view of best practice and our current view of finding as many mechanisms as possible to um, give tools for users to um, fit within exemptions around regulation. Mm -hmm. So um, there are multiple, um, so regulation is a very complex subject um, and it's, it's jurisdiction based and you should always um, seek your own advice and so on with all these sort of things. Yeah. But having run an exchange for eight years and it was the first exchange to be regulated in Gibraltar and spends a lot of time uh, with a lot of uh, regulatory advisors and so on and so forth, um, you become aware of certain exemptions which are um, exist around regulation. And um, what we, one of the things that became clear with, with Fedimint and feder federations was that it already naturally fit within certain exemptions. And so why not try and uh, make people aware of some of these and fit in as many as possible. So some of the exemptions or um, cases around, for example, Bitcoin nodes operations, because they're unattended operation, that is a 
indication that it could be. All these are indications. Nothing mm. is ever given black and white to immigration. But unintended operation is a good indication of of um, something being potentially out of of um, regulation. Could you uh, not be considered a money transmitter in the US? Um, again, um, it depends yeah. on where. But if you're operating in an unintended manner, again, you should always seek advice. But if you're operating in an unintended manner, if you are doing something and this is one of the strongest um, exemptions, is if you're doing something that is um, not by way of business, that is, that, is a reg that is an exemption which you see in multiple reasonable jurisdictions. Um, and that's why if you are not looking to make money yeah. from running this, that would, and you're doing it for people you had a pre-existing social relationship with, friends and family, et cetera, um, that would seem to fit the evidence that you're not running it by way of business. Um, and the reason why that is an exemption um, is if you think about it logically, imagine um, the number of times you perform something that could be considered a, a regulatory activity, um, but you're doing it for friends and family, you're not looking to make money. If I'm holding money in a piggy bank for my son, am I a custodian? Uh, would I need to be regulated? If I'm going to the shops and taking money from my friends to buy something on the way to shops, am I a money transmitter? If I go and say, yeah, you should buy Bitcoin, am I a financial advisor? If you're not looking to make money from it and you're doing it by way of, uh, for friends and family or people with pre-existing relationships with, again, obviously these things will all have to be, yeah. it's always case dependent and country dependent, but that is, a stated a stated exemption in the UK, in the US, and, and another one is a third one which we um, are just by nature of the system we fall within. Is again another test is whether you have the agency to act individually, and because again you could set it up to be a a one of one um, mm. federation, but then that doesn't seem to have the. That's why we would recommend to have at least three or four because then no one person has the ability to make a transaction without others. So again, you don't have agency to, to move money individually. No guardian has that. Um, if you're not looking to make a profit, then you're not doing something by way of business and you're doing it for people you have a pre-existing relationship with. If you are, if it's just operating and in the main, the day-to-day the -day operation is just sitting there in a room, in a box, and you're not doing anything again, that's another area. Now, if you if you choose to not implement, the more of those you implement, the more it would it would um, give you a tool to say that you're not doing this by way of business and be exempt. The less you do it, the more the the, the more you'd have to seek uh, advice. Can the signers in the federation collude and steal the Bitcoin? Um, if the majority of um, the answer is yes. Yeah. If it's the majority of um, of of guardians, yes. But so, is there a risk here in a scenario? Say there was, okay, let's say Bedford again. We set up a th three or five, get three trusted members, you know, and this uh, this mint starts to grow into quite a decent size. Mm. Yeah, and then Bitcoin does what it does; it goes up in value, and you know, I wouldn't do it, but just say I did. Say I said, you know what, guys, there's there's a few million here. Let's let's steal this and do one like is that does that exist as a risk and how, how much have you thought that through because it uh well we spend a lot of time thinking it yeah, through because um, I'm, I'm just wondering the thing i'm thinking is like is it a little bit uh are we encroaching on a little bit on that not your keys not your bitcoin you, you're kind of giving up your private keys so um the so there's two parts to that question i'll start with the last part first um sorry and i need to throw one other thing in there so you, okay so, i might forget then no, no, <laughs> my just memory to, is, to make it make logic yeah. so if we still stole the bitcoin from the mink does that automatically burn the other coins that exist within the wallets no um and people find out when they try to withdraw and it's it's uh it was fraction of reserve effectively yeah and so you won't know if you draw it you try to withdraw and there's no money to withdraw and it will fail. Can, can that happen then? Um, if the um, majority of guardians collude, then yes, they can move Bitcoin individually because they're all, they, they have a multi-signature 
they have a multi-signature wallet. So if they work together, they can they can take the Bitcoin off. Right. Which is why it's important to choose people who you trust to have um, a background of prioritizing social capital over financial capital. No, and I get, yeah. I can think of some great examples. Michael Peterson in El Salvador, I would say him as a federation. Yeah. You can really trust yeah. in Jorge there as well. I can think of a group of people, but I'm just saying, if if these federations become you know, quite commonplace, mm. it, you, know, you can't help people police everyone who is part of. So, what, is, what, does it so exist as something that can happen? There's a lot of questions I might forget. I that, yeah, basically, so, can, but, but, can it be but, stolen? But that, so, what, first of all, can we do something? We 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 think about it a lot. Yeah, and. Um, one, the recommendations of um, to try and work with second party trusted relationship. And the second party is someone you have a pre existing, long standing relationship with as a separate to a third party. It is a thing, a second party. Um, a third party is someone that you, is not yourself, first party, is not someone that you have a pre existing relationship with. So, not friends, family, co workers, and so on, that you've built a human level of understanding about how much you can trust them. And then there's a third party where it's basically someone you have no, um, no first-hand knowledge of other than what they've told you through advertising or media or, or giveaways or so on. But effectively, it's a stranger, and that's a third party. So we, we have recommended that um, having custodied um, you know, many, many millions of people's money for eight years um, and seen what's happened in the... In the uh, and the incentives around third party custody, um, my strong recommendation is, is to go for second party um, trust because there's, there's two things that people value, financial capital, but also social capital is something that is valuable in society. So, And there are some people who index very high on how much they value so, um, social capital. Um, and then on top of that, we use technology to federate that. So now, because obviously people can always change, but if you have a, a group of them working together and you need more to them to collude, that will, we believe, will be a good step in terms of reducing. But um, it goes further than that because not only are they working together to collude, um, to, they'll have to work together to collude, which goes against their own social incentives. They'll be ostracized from the community that they've spent their life trying to build up a reputation with. But we as the producers of the system are looking to add in and bake in education in, and helpful information to guide people to protect them as well, as much as we can. And obviously some of this will be learning. There's, there's no way you can guarantee we cover everything. But for example, when you join a federation, we will probably ask you to ask questions. For example, is this, do you know the guardians of the federation? Have you, has the person um, who introduced you informed you of that information? If you're not aware of who they are, then maybe you shouldn't join the federation and stuff like this. So um, there are various points when you, along the way where, especially as we're dealing with um, more and more people using Bitcoin, the average level of knowledge of how to safely handle your money will tend to reduce. So it's important we think, and we think other wallets should do this as well, bake in best practice guidelines to when receiving money, when sending money, when joining federations, or um, what you should do and what you should think about. It's like checklists. There's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto, which- Checklist Manifesto. It's an amazing book. <laughs> it talks about how the power of just going through checklists massively reduced the um, massively reduced the rate of um, plane crashes. It's it's in in the army, and also it's had a bigger effect than any other intervention in reduce in increasing the positive outcomes in hospitals. Because most of the time, it's due to people just forgetting to do things, or and so we're going to want to implement so those sort of um, um, mindsets and and ideas. Didn't that come up the other day? When I was talking about checklists in the pub. You're a check, checklist maxi. But did the checklist manifesto come up? Oh, I don't know. I've got to dig that out. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, it's, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great book. But it's, it's a similar idea. Just keep checking things. And one thing that we could check, for example, is 
if it looks like the size of a, a mint, because we can still observe the amount of money being held by the mint is above a certain size, we could say, look, you are holding this much money on this mint. Maybe you should consider splitting your money across multiple mints. You know, and again, we can, we can as an app say, look, we can observe that this size of mint is, is large. To, to move between mints is, is a lightning transaction and it costs fractions of a, you know, it, it could be done in seconds and so on. So, and joining mints is so easy. You should decentralize your risk so we can again provide reminders because people might not think about that. But if uh, it does. Or set up your own mints. Um, if this mint that you're joining is becoming too large, maybe you should set up a, a smaller community mint for your family and so on, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. It does remind me a little bit of it's kind of taken one step back towards banking. I'm not saying this is a criticism, but like mm. today I had to do a bank transfer. Um, I bought a bed <laughs> of all sides okay. of things. In Bedford. Uh, I didn't buy a bed in Bedford. I bought okay. a bed in, uh, from, I think, Surrey. Okay. But, uh, but um, when I put in their details, it asked me a couple of questions. Do you know them? Do you trust this company? Like it was like a checklist of things they asked me about. Now they asked me things that you wouldn't do. It was part of this. They were like, "What are you buying?" And they wanted actually, you know, some kind of check the transaction kind of stuff, some KYC, AML kind of questions like, "What are you buying? Who's it for?" But the first question I've had it a few times. Do you know? Do you trust this person? Are these details correct? There's like these little checks in place, and um, it's just kind of interesting because I'm thinking you're trying to find solutions to the fact that this is a we're going. We're taking some Bitcoin from trustless to part trusted, but I guess you're saying like you're making it. You're focused on the people who have no exchanges who've got yeah, full trust to be yeah, less trustless. No, this is not about. Um, I mean, some people who because because of the privacy guarantees that you get will find it um, if they're self custodying to take you know they're spending money and instead of spending it from their own. Um, their own set of private keys and their own wallet, um, sending it first to a federation and spending it within there because it will, it will improve their privacy, that their I personal get. privacy. So, um, so there will be that use case, but that's not our focus. Um, if you see our, our site, our focus is about the fact that um, billions of people are either excluded from using either solution, so first party custody or third party custody, and the the billions who are potentially capable of um, custodying on exchange, uh, custodying, most of them are currently destined to be custodying on exchanges. So we're talking about the ninety to ninety five percent who either have no option or it's third party stranger custody as the option. And from that point of view, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. It's not about um, getting the people who have the ability; they have the the monetary means. They have the technical means, and they just have the the confidence, the self confidence to self custody. If you have all three of those, then you you should definitely do that. That's that's the as I say, that's the Bitcoin standard, that's the gold or the Bitcoin standard. And there are there are um, services like Casa, like Unchained, and so on, who if you have the monetary means and it's a larger amount that you're holding that can help you and steer you through the path of doing it in a multi-signature manner and, and make sure that you follow best practice as well. But the idea of, um, but that's five, 10, maybe 20% of the market. And we're talking about 80 to 90% of the market, which is currently destined to not have any option at all or to hold it on an exchange. And this is, this is a step in the right direction. Separately, um, in terms of checklists, that's just good for anyone, I, I would suggest even in a first party wallet um, and you're about to make a payment, it would be good to ask questions, you know, have, you know, cause people, um, we see it, I see it a lot, especially it was very, it's still prevalent now, but it was very prevalent a few years ago in, in um, parts of uh, West Africa, various scams. There was one coin, there yeah. was BitConnect, there were a few more, I've, I've lost track of the number and people would, fall for these scams and some would be storing Bitcoin first party. But if there was a reminder in that app to be careful, it does it look like a Ponzi scheme or so on and so forth, that could have helped um, save um, people. If people want to turn off those notes and not have them, it's fine. But if we know that these are 
um, potential pitfalls or mistakes that people make. Um, the value and, and benefit of just reminding people to think about these things before doing a transaction is it doesn't affect decentralization. That's just about trying to help them in a way which is separate to anything external happening to them. So that way, because you have to remember one of the most common ways of getting money from people is um, confidence strictures will not do take, it won't be a technical approach. It will be just, you've built up confidence in me and I'm telling you to do this thing. Yep. If the app says, is anybody telling you to do this thing? Stop. Then that's the final check. And so, and that's probably going to be the most common way um, most people will be scammed or so on. It's the, uh, the, the, the trust spectrum is quite interesting mm. because um, you, we're talking about some people here trying to get them off exchange and trying to get them to maybe use a, one of these mints, which kind of makes sense because it's a better scenario. But I could also see a scenario where there are certain exchanges I would perhaps trust in certain mints because the company is so big. So Quadriga obviously put me in a position where I don't, I wouldn't trust any small exchange. But the top kind of three or five, like your Coinbase, your Gemini, your Krakens, in some ways, I, it's not that I, I don't trust the regulatory bodies around them, make force them to confiscate your coins, but I trust them not to fuck up losing my coins, possibly more than I would trust maybe a two or three federation where I you know don't know the people. Do you, do you see what I mean? There's like different trust models that go on here. So I think the first point to say is that there's a spectrum yeah, and totally. everybody has to make their own decisions. And so if you're in a country which has rule of law, um, is not managed by dictatorship or authoritarian rule, by the way, you're already now at the minority of, of, of the world. Glad to you're, now, that. You're, you're, not, you're now at the minority of the world. Um, and then you have um, exchanges that are that you feel that you can trust, um, and you're happy to pay the fees for doing that. And they're also happy to have you as a customer as well, because they're regulated entities. So, therefore, by definition, they will have a criteria for who who cannot join. By definition, that means some people don't fit the criteria. Mm. So you might want to join them. They may not want to have you as a as a customer. So if you can get through all of those hurdles, and then then you're, you're free to make that choice. Um, I think a mistake I might be making though is I'm kind of envisaging this from the privilege of uh, a stable Western liberal democracy, where I've got you know multiple options in terms yeah. of kind of uh, re uh, exchanges that have built a solid reputation to multi-sig solutions to good hardware wallet access, whereas really you're solving a problem for people in much more challenging environments. For me, I see the pri the pr privacy option is where essentially I, if I want to send to Danny, I send it into my uh, into the federation and then send from there. That totally makes sense. But I yeah, would never keep all my Bitcoin in a federation. This is, uh, um I think it's. I think people see the value of um, the, the privacy value of it, but also um, people who are currently in, even in the in the West, who are in sort of Uncle Jim mode. They've they they're the they're the Bitcoin knowledgeable person within their family, and people are asking them to advise them on Bitcoin, help them buy Bitcoin, help them hold Bitcoin already. Again, people will be doing this in this ad hoc manner. This is a this allows you to do it that at least do that in a more better practice manner uh, with lower efforts because instead of just being called every time they want to spend it or you can now just set this up and they and you can they can still have the same experience. My however, however, the for the um, gl thinking globally, um, it seems that and based on feedback, although there's a lot of interest in the West from a privacy point of view. There's a huge amount of interest um, uh, from the global south, and that's an area where, um, for right from the day one of starting at uh, yeah. CoinFloor, has been an area of interest for me um, in terms of Latin America, um, Middle East, uh, um, Africa, of course, and also we're seeing a lot of interest in in post-Soviet Europe as well, um, and these parts of the world where for for monetary reasons, or they're in areas of conflict, they're, they're suffering under the yoke of authoritarian regimes and uh, dictatorships, 
and this is again more than half the world there's yeah. billions of people we're talking about um they don't have those options they they often suffer under we're talking about 10 percent inflation venezuela's 20 thousand percent oh, no. inflation um you know um currency controls a lack of options for alternatives they don't have they don't always again location is dependent but some of these have very few they're either unbanked or underbanked as andreas would say and and so we're talking about billions there and if we help those billions we've already won but there will be but this is a global product and different people it's like a hammer different people will use the hammer to build a, a boat a house or a, or some or or a piece of art you know but uh it's it's a tool that can be used in different configurations do, do i seem to be overly grilling you on this particular subject or has this come up quite a bit which subject the idea that um there is a like a trust model based around the fact that people could collude i think the no it comes up a lot i think it comes up um because the most of the audience and and the places that we're talking to are, are from the global uh, north or the west and so there people really grill this uh, the idea of um uh, the idea of um for second party trust yeah um seems to be uh, um unusual although then when you say the uncle jim model most people um know either themselves without realizing it or know someone who is advising on bitcoin or um, helping people buy bitcoin or holding bitcoin on behalf of friends and family um but there is this sort of disconnect um between even though they might be doing them themselves believing that they won't be able to trust some so their trust other people are trusting them but believing that uh, it's going to be hard to find people who can trust um a, a friend or family even though they are being trusted at the very same time well we've seen that lawsuits in the uk where people have colluded on wills to try yeah. and steal so even within family groups there are trust issues no it, trust issues can happen but um ultimately um the the, the solution is we've got the ability to trust within family yeah um or you have to trust a stranger and you know there's which is what's the the current option and because the stranger um is able to provide a flashy website great advertising great marketing um, um press a number of social buttons um and um ux buttons to make you feel safe it doesn't change the fact that they may not they could become a quadriga they can become i mean we've seen recently many many recent examples of regulated institutions breaking their customers trust yep um so um it's a question of trade-offs the ultimate and ideal is for people to self custody mm -hmm. and again as part of the education and training within the app above a certain level we not only would say you know not only this this um um this federation is becoming quite large in terms of the bitcoin it's holding maybe consider um moving or splitting to reduce your risk um the app could also say your amount of bitcoin you're holding is becoming quite large maybe you should consider self custody mm. without realizing it because again people don't realize when they go from this is a small amount then it goes up 10x and so again um it's a bit like a computer game um uh again so depending on the age of the audience the one which one uh, go with it yeah yeah um when you nowadays well when there was a game called budokan the the way of 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 karate and um what would happen in this I game is this. yeah you, Hold on. it was this great game um it but this is like the the, the 90s or early 2000s danny try and find a screenshot for me oh budokan um and um b-u-d um o-k-a-n it's like spectrum it would be something like that or, yeah it's sort of pre-prince of persia yeah sort of stuff but in that game i remember buying this game like rushing to buy this game and it had this manual and the manual was like <laughs> this thick it was it was a book it was like 80 90 pages long and all these moves and so on and you sort of read the first few pages and then you just gave it 
Yeah. That's the word. Oh yeah, my Buddha God. Can. The martial spirit, that's it. Oh, yeah. And I don't know. I just remember that the manual was just like this tomb that you had to read. And it was probably one of the last ones in my mind of, of games where I read the manual because there was so many different moves. And now with modern games, what would happen is that they, instead of giving you all of these, this book to read and then you play the game, the first few levels of the game were the instructions. Yeah. And now you, there's either no instructions or just a pamphlet. And it's the same with modern electronics. They, they, board, try, yeah. to, they try to break it into the process. Because um, the understanding is that you've got, for people to educate people, you don't want to tell them to go off to this separate thing, and, but you want to bake it into the process. And so, um, and that's what leads to the best practice and the best results. So a part of what we're doing is not just, as I say, we're thinking about it holistically. It's not just incredible form of privacy, this form of decentralized custody, um, but it's also this vision of we're, end, we're trying to deal with the problem end to end, the way Apple and the, with the iPhone tried to deal with the problem of people being able to communicate end to end. So it's not just the phone, it was the stores, it was the, it was the online app store as well. So we'll be looking at how do we get people to be hyper Bitcoinized, Lightning, Bitcoin, and custody is part of it as is the end and process of what are their daily lived in experience and need for money. So remittance, make that easier, or to earn money, make that easier and so on. For, uh, but also education and best practice, we think will be to bake that into the app as well. So there will be a time when you get above a certain value that it makes sense to self custody. And we, and it shouldn't just be us. We think it makes sense in the app to start saying, well, maybe you should think about self-custodying, even helping them to get to that process. Mm. So, um, yeah. I feel like you were trying to jump in a couple of times there. No. I, it should be louder, man. Just say, shut the fuck up, Pete. I was just wondering if there's like a physical security issue where if the guardians have to be a, or don't have to be, but are largely public figures. And they're, say it's a three or five guardianship, you, you could use like, Bitcoin podcast as an example. So it could be like Stefan, Peter, Matt O'Dell, Marty Ben, Daniel Prince, let's say. You got a three of a five. Does a $5 wrench attack become a three a $15 wrench attack when one federation controls a fair amount of money? Are they is there a physical attack a physical threat to those people guarding guarding it? Gardening? Gard not gardening. 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 I like that. Gardening, gardening. the gardening the federation. <laughs> Um, so I guess it depends on the context and it depends on, um, if, for example, if it's a, a regime that can be violent and so on, the risk is higher or lower. If you're already public figures, there's already a risk you're taking on because mm -hmm. people are going to be aware that you're in the space and they're going to make assumptions anyway. Um, one thing to remember is that guardians do not need to be um, physically connected with the community. They just have to be connected from a relationship point of view. So let's take the scenario where um, you have a family and some are in the diaspora and they're often sending money home to, to relatives abroad. And there's a village with many, many people who are based, uh, who are the recipients. And that village might be in a place which is actually not necessarily safe to be a guardian. But the, the diaspora, members of the diaspora could be the guardians who are in New York and London. And they're often sending large parts of their paycheck back to, um, to the people back in the village. It's a very common scenario. So if they're already giving large parts of their money to the federation, uh, to, to, the, um, to the village or to the relatives abroad, um, it seems that you could probably trust them to, to custody the money that they've been spending and giving as well but also it means that their location is physically separate to where most of the money is being used um the other thing is because of the way of the sort of peer-to-peer -peer nature of how federations are formed um within outside of the federation there's no reason for anyone else outside of the federation unless you publicly announce that i've got this federation to ever know about it. Okay. Because you, a group of people who are, say, we want to set up a federation, the village will then say, okay, we, these people could be, again, they could be in, in the West, for example, because that's where they're, they're working and earning, for example. 
they set up the federation or they could be in the same place and then they will people will join on a person to person basis scan their qr code and they have sort of no incentive to tell anyone else that they're part of a federation it looks like a um a a wallet app it acts like a wallet app on chain it appears like a wallet um and you're getting benefit it doesn't benefit you to tell people um that you're using it as a as a part of a federation or who the guardians are unless the guardians are making a fee presumably uh, we we are, I, I mean if they're making why would that make would they you not want to incentivize more people to come in if they're making a fee um potentially that's an interesting point potentially mm. but as i said my recommendation is to not charge a fee it just makes things simpler you're not earning any revenue from it therefore you don't have to deal with tax issues and and, and corporation tax and you you reduce the risk of being considered a regulated activity which would increase your overhead by a thousand fold so probably dwarfing any revenue you make from from the, if you do take that route because making a commercial enterprise that's profitable is not an easy thing to do mm -hmm. but um, especially in bitcoin yeah and and you always have the ability to um for example um it's a guardian might be a, an obvious candidate to have a lightning um, node that services the federation yeah. and that can make money because it's a separate thing and that, that and that feder that lightning node doesn't need to be trusted by the federation and so because it doesn't need to be trusted by the federation it's it's much lower risk for that to be a profitable enterprise and mm -hmm. also a federation can have multiple lightning nodes or federation members connect to multiple lightning nodes so it leads to a competitive marketplace so you don't need to um, but the, the creation of a productive um, Bitcoin community leads to multiple opportunities to generate revenue in other ways. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much chain, chain analysis are looking at you guys thinking, hmm, what do we do about this? Uh, well, they, I mean, if and when, not if, when, when um, of course, like um, federations, federal federations are widespread and we're talking about tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of them um, within the federation as i say it's cryptographically near perfect privacy there is it, it, you're, you're severely limiting what what can be done by an organization like chain analysis um so yeah Good. i don't cool. know what i don't know what they'll be thinking about it yeah um talk to me about the privacy why is the privacy so good well uh, so um if you take that example of the the kiosk again um so that's it's clear you know mum and dad and um and children go off into this fairground and they each ride is like a merchant or service or whatever they, they're using it for um the the exchange in that example you could probably imagine it's a clear piece of glass in in front of the kiosk but um the the innovation by david chan was this thing called blinded signatures and this can be described in many ways but in this example imagine that the um imagine that the kiosk window is painted over black so all you have is the hole in the wall to pass through um i had a weird thought there uh, but, i know, uh, know where you're going there <laughs> all in the wall to pass through <laughs> Fast through the Bitcoin, okay. <laughs> uh, I think both of our heads were going there. That's also really wrong. But anyway, we're so, talking, we talking George Michael here. So yeah, anyway, yes, yeah, so that's the fair, the the fairground glory hole. But you you um <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck is this? I thought uh, it was a conversation about privacy as well. The privy, privacy. Um anyway. So you, you glory holes to, offer pretty good privacy. Yeah, um, privacy in the privy. But um, <laughs> so you, you go to, you go to this kiosk, you, you you paint over the window, and and you you pass through your Bitcoin, and you get back these IOUs. Now, um, <laughs> <laughs> what do you owe me? <laughs> so, oh my days. <laughs> I, I'm trying to keep a straight face here. I know, I, 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 I will look, look you in the eye. We're doing a good job, we're Come doing on. a good job. I will look you in the eye. So you give back the IOs and, um, 
effectively, you as the kiosk operator have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my days! You you have no idea who you're who you're you're giving the IOUs to, and so if you add to the fact that once they have the IOUs, they they can do whatever they want within the within the fairgrounds. They can exchange tokens, pass it to other friends, etc. You can you can just intuit the fact that you basically have perfect privacy. You're you as the kiosk operator have no idea how many people are inside the fairground. Um, what they're transacting for, when you're providing change, who you're providing change for, when people are redeeming, who are people redeeming for. And so although it's a very simple idea conceptually, and um, the cryptography is 40 years, nearly 40 years old, 1983. Um, yeah, it's like 39 years old. Conceptually, it provides cryptographically near perfect privacy. There is some, you can still do, you know, potentially timing attacks and so on. Um, you can also, you will have different types of token. So you'll have um, $1 denomination tokens or 0 0.01 sats tokens, 0 0.1 sats tokens, um, uh, sorry, 0 0.01 Bitcoin or 10,000 yeah. sats, 100,000 sat tokens. So you would, you would have an idea of how many of a given type you have, but that's across the entire user base and that's, so that's why we say it's near perfect because for practical purposes, you don't want everybody to just walk around with tons and tons and tons of sats tokens. Yeah. So you need to have different denominations, just like normal cash. Yeah. Whew, I just stopped looking. We, at we, we did well. I, I think we I think we recovered it there at the yeah, end. Yeah, I think so. I just hope, hope my dad doesn't listen to that one. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, congratulations on the raise. Was it 4.2? Yeah, 4.20. Um, and um, nice. it was... Uh, um, 21 million post money valuation as well. Um, we it we means are, that you could just do what the fuck you want. Oh, we could we could do a lot, but also um, there's tons there's tons of the site's designed to be very simple, but there's lots of little Easter eggs. Oh like, man, get it up! Yeah. Um, um, no, but congratulations on that. That's 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 pretty impressive. How how are you guys gonna intending on making money yourself? Is it just you charge people to use the wallet? Are you uh, it's, it's the wallet. fees? So the, wallets are hard to make money off sometimes. I know some are doing okay. Yeah, but um, so there's there's a lot of ways when you get, I mean, our target is to get um, a billion users using this software. Wow. And um, my goal is to get that in a relatively short period of time. Tell me, come on, how long are you going for? Um, in a matter of a few years. Yeah. And um, that's Fediment. Um, Feddy is, uh, oh, okay. no, you can, you can show both because Fediment is the protocol. Mm -hmm. It's good to see the two. And the protocol is this open source protocol. Um, it's great because we have m incredible support by, by the development community. What's so, the Feddy website? Feddy, F-E-D-I dot X, Y, Z. So, but it's good to see both. So, um, yeah, so this is Feddy, and this is for the wallet. And as we say, our focus is getting people off exchanges. And there's people can't who want to be on exchanges who can't even get on exchanges. And so that's where Feddy, um, powered by Fediment, helps. Um, we got an incredible set of investors, um, one other I can't mention yet, um, but all Bitcoin only um, and yeah, so this is so, but yeah, at the bottom, they're just little little subtle things. We say established, but we have a block height. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that block height, um, what's yours? Block height, you know, like the, the football team. Get, oh, yes, get up our, get up but our logo, just but just like on the, the if you add it up, it's seven plus four plus five plus five equals 21 as well. <laughs> so, so you have has, to wait for that block. Uh, we waited for that, and also when you go on the block, the amount sending is 21 million, um, milli satoshis as well. And the change is, is 7 million million Satoshis, which is 21 million divided by three because of the three founders. So There's do you, you, do you like football? I, I, my, my team is QPR. Wow. So, so no. So, so <laughs> you do, you yeah, know, it's, it's a, <laughs> I, no, So, so I, obviously comment. all teams on their logo, they have the year they're established. We yeah. went for the block we established in. Uh, and you waited for that block, did yeah. you? Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. That block didn't matter. I just literally, when I did the uh, registration, I went for it. 
We've also got um I'll get I'll bring a shirt down and show you. We've also got running Bitcoin on the back of the shirt. Yeah, these little little yeah, Easter eggs yeah. in there. Um it's amazing. Uh, it's, our first tweet on our on our, our tweet post was the block height. And we also add an opera turn on that block that says so if you go to the uh to the website just briefly and um I think if you click on the on that block is an opera turn. Ferdy has arrived. Yeah. So we, we, we also got the block at that time and the amount is is because we think about the lightning network is one thousandth of a sat. So it's twenty one <laughs> million hmm. millisets. Very as cool. well. So there's all this really cool stuff. How do you guarantee it gets into that block? Uh we use a lock time. Uh, okay. We use an end lock time so that it would come in the block afterwards. You can't guarantee for no. sure, but but you know. You'd be so pissed if it had been the block afterwards. <laughs> no, we, would, we would have still been 22. fine. No, look, it's very cool, man. It's very cool. Uh, I like what you're doing. And uh, uh, I wish you all the best with this. It's Thank um, you. Uh, very interesting. I love the buzz that's around it. I love the fact that it's a Bitcoin-only project. I love the fact that you're doing it. Your investors are fucking great. It the ones to, I know of. You're it has to be Bitcoin-only. You're that? wearing their hat. Yes, yeah, 1031. Yeah. Do you, do you know what's so cool about this? Tell me. It's my birthday. Oh, really? Yeah, I was born on Halloween. Wow. So I've got the, the pumpkin up here on my... So you're destined to be involved with Bitcoin then? Yeah. Well, I don't want to don't start any rumors. Uh, <laughs> all right, tell people where to go. I mean, we've just had out, but tell people where to go to find out more. Who do you want to hear from? Yeah. So if you want to find out more, definitely go to feddy.xyz for the wallet to, to hear about over the coming months when we launch it. And Feddy Mint, if you're really interested in working on the open source protocol, both both the commercial company and Fediment are looking for incredible engineers to work on it. And then to find out about us, um, Feddy BTC on Twitter and then me, self, myself personally, OB, OBI on Twitter. Uh, and is there anything I didn't ask you you wish I had asked you? Um, well, the segue into uh, Glory Hall is really <laughs> just real. But um, no, there was, I mean, there's an incredible amount of. Um, um, human rights defenders, activists, and uh, that we're working with to, to, and we're trying to select the first places where we are going to put a lot of effort to, to not just roll this out, but get to hyper Bitcoinization. Um, but I think we covered a lot of things and it was, maybe we can have a follow-up conversation. Whenever, man, time. listen, yeah. you're welcome on whenever. I mean, maybe once it's out there, I think that's somebody's a good using idea. it and like get some yeah. feedback on it. Uh, are you going out to the conference in Ghana? Yeah, December. yeah, we'll be we're sponsoring it. Okay, I didn't know that. And we're gonna we might might have something to announce there. Well, we might be there. Yeah, no, you should definitely. But there's going to be a lot of people are going to be surprised because you know I'm also a board member at B Trust and so on. You basically saying Jay Z is going to be there? I'm not commenting <laughs> on, but there's going to be there's going to be lots of interesting people there. Have you got to hang out with them? Um, I, I uh, we don't we it? don't but it, we don't talk about the talk conversation, about but. <laughs> But it's they're, they're an incredible group of people working on it. And also the people who helped bring the, not just the board members I work with, um, who are amazing, but also the people who helped bring us together. It's, 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 I feel very fortunate. I'm working on all Bitcoin, all with empowering the global self, all with global impact and all the time. So Are I you living your best that. life, man? I'm living the best life right now. Well, dude, listen, anything we can ever do, you hit us up, you give us a shout. Thank you. If you want us to share anything, you want to come on the show, you've got something new to tell us, tell us. This is a very cool project and it's a real honor to have you on to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, I wish you the best and uh, can we eat yet? we got about a couple of hours. we got to wait till 6.30. 6.30, yeah, uh, intermittent fasting. Jesus, man. All right, yeah. well, we'll wait till 6.30 <laughs> to eat. But listen, all the best, man. appreciate it. Thank you, you very much. We're going to work really hard to deliver on everybody's been looking for. I think you're going to absolutely crush it. We will. We will. Thank you. All right, man. See ya.